house again tonight. Everybody's had a good day, and they want every day or be a good day. We get up just breathing, and the opportunity to come back to his house. It's good to see everybody. Got your Bible? Be turning to the book of Matthew, chapter number six. Matthew, chapter number six. <laughs> Shift, I ain't gonna get to go with it, but it's a good meeting every year. Brother Leonard Fletcher from up Mountain City, Tennessee, we're we'll preaching every night. And it's a good camp meeting, been up there, I guess, close to 50 years now. It's up on Pensacola up there, you can't miss it. Anybody gets a chance to go, you can enjoy it one night. Good fellowship every year, the Lord seems to meet out. Good meeting. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 33. I'm going to key in on one word in this verse in just a minute. The Bible said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. I want you to notice there in verse 33, the Bible said, But seek ye first. That word first. And you know, there's some things when you study this Bible, and if you get to looking for this word first, there's some things that God tells us to put first. And there these things that he tells us to put first, man, they're of utmost importance. If you ever become a strong Christian or have a powerful Christian life, and that word first is what I'm going to key in on for a little while tonight. And you look that word first up in the dictionary, it'll tell you preceding all others as in time, order, or importance. It says before any other in preference to something else. So this evening, I want to look at this word first for a little while tonight. I want us to stop and look at ourselves, I guess, for a few minutes tonight too and see what we're putting first in our lives. You know, if we ain't real careful in the day and time we're living in, busy as everything is, and if you ain't real careful, you'll wind up putting your job before God. You'll wind up putting money before God. You'll wind up putting, I mean, a lot of different activities before Him. But there's some things in this Bible that the Lord tells us to put first. And if we really believe the Bible, we ought to be putting these things first in our life. It's the only way that we can please Him. It's the only way we'll ever grow strong as Christians. It said, but seek ye first. So I'm going to look at some things here for a little while, and I won't try to keep you real long tonight, but I want to look at some things that God says to put first. And we're going to be looking probably four or five different places in the Scripture. We'll be turning a little bit tonight. I don't like to do that, but we're going to turn back and forth some different, some different uh, books of the Bible in different places. But first, I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 23 and see something that the Lord tells us to put first. Brother touched on it a little bit this morning in Sunday school. There's something here that we need to see the Lord says to put first in our lives. Matthew chapter 23, in verse number 23 through 26, you'll find that the Lord says first to cleanse, cleanse the inside of the cup. Now these things that we're going to look at tonight, they're no, in no particular order of importance, but they're things that He says to put first. Matthew 23. In verse 23 through 26, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Those all ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides would strain the gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Now notice verse 26. The Bible said, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outer side of them may be clean also. Now what you see here in Matthew chapter 23, it's pretty much a, a picture of reformation versus regeneration. 
And when you're talking about reformation or form, reform, it only cleans or takes care of the outside of something. And you know, it, it's bad. A lot of religions like that. It always has been. Back in Jesus' day, these Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites were that way. They tried to put on a big show most of the time for they'd come to the house of God, they'd dress certain ways, act certain ways, put on a show outwardly, but the inside was all messed up. The inside wasn't right with God. The inside had never been cleaned up. And you know, these Pharisees made a good show in the flesh. They looked religious, they acted religious, they played the part real well. They may even look different than what the world looked. But I don't know if you've ever been around any of this crowd. They make me mad real quick. Because most of the time they're trying to tell everybody else how to live, trying to tell everybody else how to do this, that, and the other. But they don't never look at your sales. They keep their nose up in the air all the time. They're all the time pointing fingers or poking at somebody else. And you know, that's simply what religion is. It leaves people a lot of times just the way they are on the inside. And you know, if you'll study your Bible, Jesus wasn't that way. Man, he went to where the wicked people was at, where the lost people was at, where the adulteress was at, and he took them just the way they were. Now these Pharisees and scribes, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow a woman like at the well to even come around. I mean, they wouldn't allow any of these folks that were caught in adultery that Jesus forgive them of their sins ever to come around. They wanted to stone them, beat them down. But if they got them around, they wanted to clean them up first. But look what Jesus said there in verse 26. said, Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which was in the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Now, you, anybody in here that's ever washed a dish or anything knows most of the time if you wash a cup, you're going to probably go to the inside of that thing first and get it clean. Get whatever's on the inside of it that's been in there stained, whatever food's left in it. You get a coffee cup if it's been set in a while, you'll clean that coffee out before you do the, the, the outside of it. Now when you get this inside of the things cleaned up, it'll take care of the rest of it. The outside of it will clean up itself. You know when a person gets saved and that inside's cleaned up, that heart and soul, that new man will clean himself up on the outside. I mean, I know that goes sounds like against nature a lot of times. There's a fight against the flesh and spirit. I mean, totally after a person gets saved. But Jesus said, Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which is in the cup. And you know, that's one thing that I've noticed, especially the last 15 years or so, being in the ministry, they some of these crowds, these cliques you run with, you don't do things just the way they do, hey, they ain't going to have nothing to do with you. But I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to let the brethren run me down. I'm not going to let them hurt me. Hey, that crowd wants to be that way, that's the way they can be. But this book teaches a totally whole different doctrine. Clean the inside up first. And you know, Jesus does a good job at that. You can find every, a lot of different examples in the New Testament. That last three and a half years of his ministry, I mean, man, he, he cleansed those leopards. He cleansed those, I mean, it was full of devils, cast them out. And that started on the inside. And man, when that starts on the inside, it'll work its way out. I mean, these things, we, you, you hear very little of these things taught on anymore, preached on. I don't know what it is, but a lot of folks afraid they'll make people mad. But he said we need to do this first. Cleans the inside of it. And I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 7, there's something else he says there that needs to be cleaned first also. Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. I'm going to get a read, reading about verse number 1. The Bible said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how will they say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine, eye, in thine eye. Thy hypocrite first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. 
Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and ring them. Now notice there in verse number 5, it said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Now then you notice in your Bible, these words are in red. And this is Jesus speaking. And you know what I like about listening, reading after Jesus? and Man, wouldn't you like to hurt him? He just plain spoke. And you know, plain talk is easy understood a lot of times. I mean, it gets through to people. They understand what you're saying. But he's talking to the hypocrites again. He said, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own mind. And you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying you first got to get your own heart right. Stop looking at other people's faults because you've got plenty of them yourself. I mean, these things are plain and simple that we forgot about. You know, we're living in a day that seems like a lot of self-righteousness. And you know, a lot of them are saying, what I'm doing is all right. And you know, a lot of them will look at you and say, well, you better stop doing what you're doing. I mean, they make me totally sick most of the time. And you know these folks have got things going on in their own lives. Then they start poking at everybody else. And you know, that does a lot of damage. It does a lot of harm around the house of God. And you know, they poke fingers at folks. We got this thing seems like anymore. You got this one crowd and say, well, I've got convictions about this. And let me tell you something. You better be real careful when you start talking about convictions. Yeah, God convicts people of doing things. But if those convictions don't line up with this Bible, are they really convictions? A lot of times they're more preferences than convictions. And there's a lot of folks like to shove this stuff down people's throat there. I can name a million different things. I mean, you'll hear some of this crowd want to talk about hair length. There's some of them will let me get up in the pulpit because I've got hair on my face. They said they plucked Jesus' beard out. And there's a lot of this stuff going around and it's killing Christianity. A lot of it's preference instead of conviction. But conviction's a wonderful thing if God's laid something on your heart. He might lay something on my heart but I order not shove it down somebody else's throat like the hypocrites do. He says, get that beam out of your own eye first. And you, you know, if it don't line up with the Bible, you just need to leave it alone. I mean, a lot of this crowd wants to lay heavy burdens on people. And then I've seen that stuff over the years. Some of, some of these preachers wants to lay such heavy burdens on their wives. And they, I, I mean, man, they, some of this stuff they put on them just ain't right. Sure, they ought to live clean. They ought to look like a Christian. They ought to uh, talk like a Christian and things, dress like a Christian. But some of them's going way overboard with this stuff, way out of bounds. And I mean, it just makes life miserable. I, I've seen preachers' homes, man, just split right down the middle of the last few years over that stuff. You can't lay such a heavy burden on people as some of them try to do. But he's talking about first get the beam out of her own eye. You know, that crowd loves their own selves is what they do. And they don't love anybody around them, seems like. So there's two things we've mentioned that he said, clean the inside of the cup first. Get the beam out of your own eye first. Then in Matthew cha chapter number 5, Jesus goes at this crowd again, Matthew chapter 5, down about verse number 22 through 24. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5. The Bible said, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Rachel shall be, be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore if they bring, a, bring thy gift to the altar and their remembrance thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first. Be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer any gift to thy gift. Now notice verse 24. It said, first be reconciled to the brother. Now this is talking about a forgiving spirit. And you know that's a true mark of a real Christian a forgiving spirit. I, I've heard this thing said a whole lot. I can forgive but I can't forgive. You know, I'm glad Jesus was able to forget or was able to forgive and he was able to forgive my sins. Man, those things won't be brought up that are done before I got saved. But he's dealing with for a forgiving spirit right here. And you know, we have a, have a need, man, right now of a forgiving spirit, I guess, much as we ever have. 
And we need, we've got a great need of being right with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know, especially here in these mountains, that's one reason you see so many churches sitting on every corner. Where folks can't be, was not able to get along over the years, would not reconcile, would not forgive each other. And then part of them will go off one direction, part another direction, and they'll start another church. I know it's been just a few years back, me and my wife was out on the road there going to a church to preach there. We left one Saturday evening, was going to preach the next morning. We counted in one, one stretch road, ain't going to say words, I think it was like 15 churches within a quarter of a mile. First thing hit my mind, I mean, it just something funny come out. I said, well, there you can tell they couldn't get along over the years. One right here, and that's probably what happened. But he's talking about a forgiving spirit. And a lot of folks, you'll get to talking to people sometimes and say, well, they've done me dirt. And you'll hear some of them say, the last thing I'll do, I'll go to my grave before I ever forgive them. Notice what the Lord told, told this crowd right here. He, he told them pretty much right there, he's talking about bringing their offerings and stuff. Don't even bring that till you get this right. You know, if you've got an awe against your brother, got something against somebody, it's not going to do you any good to get down to pray. And it ain't going to do you any good, I mean, to get down and try to study the Bible, read the Bible or anything until you get that thing right. And you know, if you go to that person which you may have a problem with, and they won't make it right with you, if you go and do everything you can possibly do, you'll be all right then. You've done your part of it. Then ask God to forgive you, and you can go on. And I know there's some people that will never forgive you of something. And a lot of these things are over nothing most of the time, just jealousy and different things such as that. But he said, first be reconciled to thy brother. You know, if we, we this needs to be a big deal. I mean, a lot of folks act like it's not. But if you don't do these things, it's going to hinder your prayer life. It's going to hinder your fellowship with each other, your worship. You know, it's going to hinder your closeness with God. You know, we better be glad that the Lord's not like that. You know, He gives us an opportunity to repent every day. He tells us to repent before the sun goes down upon our wrath. He's a God that loves us. You know, when that prodigal son wandered off over there, you know, when he came back, the prodigal brother didn't like it too much. He missed out on a lot of blessings. But the boy came back and the father forgave him. The Bible tells us he run and fell and kissed him, put shoes on his feet, a ring on his finger, a robe upon his back. After all that he had done to the Father. You know, I'm glad he loves us that way. But this, re, this thing being reconciled. You know, a lot of times it takes just getting a little bit of that pride out of the way. Throwing it off to the side and say, God, I want you more than I, I want this out of my life. I mean, there's a lot of folks carrying, carrying this stuff around with them. They don't need to be carrying around year after year after year. It makes them miserable. And you know, when, when that stuff's there, you think about it. You lay down in the night, the devil will bring it into your mind. You'll go pondering on it. But he said, first be reconciled to thy brother. I mean, that's talking about saved people. And you know what's bad? When you got a problem with lost people, and they look at you and say, well, you're supposed to be saved. That's the ones you really need to get that made up with in a hurry. You ever have a chance to get them saved, they're going to have to see something in you. You doing things right. And it makes a difference when you do that. He said, first be reconciled to thy brother. Then I'm going to look at another thing here. Two or three more will be done over in the book of 2 Corinthians. There's something else that God says to put first there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Down about verse number 5. Second Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 5. The Bible said in this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Now this is Paul talking here in Corinthians, talking about these folks, how good they have been to him in different things. But Paul said, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. The Lord, Paul's talking here and said, Telling these folks, man, and bragging on them, so they gave their self to the Lord first. 
You know, I wonder what we're giving ourselves to in the day and time we're living in instead of Him. You know, when you give yourself to God, you're giving Him all. That's a total surrender. That's a total consecration to Him. But we ought to ask ourselves a lot of times, what are we giving ourselves to first? Now, we, we say this a whole lot, family first, and I agree with that totally. God created that family, that home, the first thing there in the Garden of Eden. But Adam and Eve still had to put God first. They had to put Him first in their home and in their lives. They, did, they got messed up when they didn't put God first. They didn't listen. They didn't listen to what God told them. Then the devil came around and they listened to Him and He lied to them. He changed the Word of God right there to begin with. And folks say, well, they've just been changing the Word of God. They've been, the Word of God's been changed ever since then. The devil changed what God said in the Garden of Eden and deceived them. They ate the tree of life. That's the reason we have to work. That's the reason we have to die ever since that day. But he created that home first. It ought to be a special thing. It ought to be held up real high. The home should <clears throat> but God ought to be first. There's got to be a balance there. But you know, we're real good a lot of time in giving God our leftovers, what we've got left out of the day, what we've got left out of the week. We, we think, well, Sunday will make up for it. We'll get, <laughs> get all this, but we'll give Him a lot of time just our bits and pieces on Sunday. But you ought to ask yourself, is He really first in your life? Have you ever laid it all down on the altar and say, Lord, here I am, use me, do whatever you want? Now that's not just for preachers, that's not just for deacons, Sunday school teachers, missionaries. That ought to be for every child of God to say, Lord, here I am, use me. Now, they, there's plenty of things out in the world, man, God can use us doing. He can use you tomorrow on the job to be a witness to somebody. He's coming first. You, you, you never realize just saying some small something to a lost person on the job, how it might affect their life. They might, and somewhere down the road, they may remember it. Somewhere down the road, you may run into them and see that they've been saved. I, I've run into people the last few years that I haven't seen in a long time. Last time I saw them, they was lost and preached somewhere sometime. And they've come up, shook my hands, and I want you to thank you. For what you told us years ago was stuck with us. It got saved somewhere along the way. You know, you never you never can tell. There may be somebody walking by this road tonight. I might stop out there and hear something I've said. Somewhere down the road, it might plant a seed in their heart. And then get saved. But God's got to come first. He, that's all God wants. You know, He don't accept anything else. He ain't going to accept our seconds. Man, he, he, he don't want just the leftovers we've got. Give you another thing. Over in the book of 1 Kings, real, real familiar passage of scripture over there in the book of 1 Kings dealing with Elijah. 1 Kings, I believe it is over there, chapter number 17. You remember Elijah had went up before Ahab and told him it wasn't going to rain. That there was going to be a drought come and all this stuff and there was a Drought in the land. Told him it wasn't going to rain again. He said it was going to rain. Remember God sent Elijah down to the brook Cherith. And God had that brook down there. And that brook was established. I mean from the beginning of time. Had a place for Elijah to go quench his thirst state. Remember God sent the birds in down there to feed Elijah. Then the brook dried up. But God had another plan. He was going to send him to a widow woman. You know, if you'll study about those widow women back in that day, they weren't known for taking people in. They just barely had enough to get by. And this widow woman had a boy. Remember when Elijah gets to him and finds him over, that woman was gathering sticks. She was going to prepare their life meal, feed that boy they were planning on dying. But look what it says in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 13. The Bible said, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make them for thy son. For thus said the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste. Now notice verse 14. The Bible said, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. If God says something, it's going to happen. It said the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the sin of Elijah, and she said in he and her house, 
did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the crews of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. But you notice back up there in verse 13, Elijah said, make me a little cake first. I want you to notice, here's a woman that give God first place an example of it. You know, Elijah said, make me a cake first. And when, 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 when a woman done this, she put God first in her life. She listened to the man of God and she had faith. Now by putting the, the, the man of God here first and putting God first, look what happened. When God had first place miracles followed. Hey, that, that barrel of oil and that, that cruise of oil, neither one of them never run out till the drought was over with. Could you imagine that? That woman could have picked that cruise of oil up and held it and poured it and poured it and never run out. She could have went to that meal barrel over and over and over. Hey, they may not have been, but just enough every time she went, but it was there. I don't know how much was there. The Bible said it didn't run out, but they was enough to feed every time they went. You know, God's a God that's always got enough. He's always got enough right when you need it. He's always right on time. Those miracles fall. And when God had first place, the need was supplied. You'll read a little farther on down through this chapter. That boy died. But you remember Elijah went up there and prayed, laid on this boy, and God brought him back to life. I mean, the miracles didn't cease to fail. You say, you think God can do things? He's the same God that done that then. He'd still do it now if he wanted to. But our faith's not like these men's faith. Well, they believe God could do these things. But we'll begin to doubt and think, well, God can't do this, but God can. You know, when God has first place, His will will be done. And you know, His will was done here in this woman's life. You'll find that God had first place in Elijah's life. Find in this next chapter over here how God's will was done. Killed all that crowd out, all those false prophets and different things. Hey, when you put God first, God will do some things. I want to show you another place. I told you I ain't going to keep you real long. Now, I want you to look in 1 Timothy. I know I've got you turned in several different places. I want to look at a scripture or two there about something else that God said to put first. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 4. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 4. The Bible said, But if any way to have children or nephews, let them learn first to show pity at home and requit their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now this is dealing with showing pity first at home, the Bible says in verse number four. Now this is talking about a widow. If you study your Bible, a widow indeed had to be somebody that didn't have nobody. The Bible talks about here that she has children or nephews. It's their responsibility first to take care of them. It's their responsibility, probably money-wise or anything like that. It's necessary to take care of this lady. He said pity should be showed first at home. And you know that that would take a lot of pressure off. You know, we expect the government and everybody to take care of our families this more, anymore, the churches and different things such as that. But the Bible said there in verse number four that she had children and nephews and things. It was their responsibility. And you know, we don't look at things like this in the Bible. I'm glad, man, that these people take care of people, though. They love people. Or willing, got a good heart to do it. I believe we're to help anybody we can anytime you've got an opportunity if there's really a need there. But he's saying how this thing is set up first right here. He said, but if any way to have children and nephews, let them learn first to show pity at home. You know, we want everybody else seems like to take our responsibilities on a lot of times. And you know, I know there's people everywhere that needs help. But the Bible said do it at first at home. And I believe you could take that a little bit farther out, man. I, I, we, I'm a man that loves missions, love missionaries, love to get to know them, love help them, love support them. But I believe we are to look right across the street before we do across the water, before we do across the world. And I believe he said to go into all the world. But you know, they went into their own people to begin with over there and preached to the Jews. Then they went out to preach to the Gentiles. 
What I, what I think is a sad thing in this country here, it's one of the biggest mission fields you can find anywhere anymore. And we forgot about our own people. We've got people that lives within walking distance of, in this country that don't know nothing about God. And it's sad. This is the Bible Belt supposed to be right here in these mountains. is a mission field. And you, you get out of these mountains, you just you head out west some places. It ain't like it is here. And you, you get on up in the upper end of Missouri, going out through Iowa, get on out into South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and them states, you ain't going to see a Baptist church anywhere. You'll run into a Catholic church or a Lutheran church every once in a while, but no Baptist churches. There's some mission. I know some good missionaries out of them places that went out in there and started churches. And it's a rough road. It's a hard life for them. It's hard to get those people to come in. And that's the reason I'm saying there's a mission field right here in this country. And I, I'm all for sending them all over the world, but man, we ought to put some money right in our own country telling people about Jesus. I tell somebody to go build a church, put a church up and sit there and tell them. Because man, it's going to be a shame man, when we've got a American citizen's blood running from our hands at the judgment seat of Christ because we've not told them. And I know it's a shame right here in this country. If you've never been out of these mountains much or been in some of these places, people don't realize it. it it's not like it is here everywhere in this country. I mean, a lot of them don't want to hear it. A lot of them will run you off. But man, we've got a mission field right here in our front door. Not millions of miles away, right in our front door, people are dying and going to hell. Let me show you the last thing here tonight. I'm going to tell you here in the book of Matthew again, chapter number 6. One other thing, I said these ain't in no particular order, but Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 33 where we started. He said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Hey, that's not talking about doing that just on Sundays, just Wednesdays, or during revival meetings or something like that. But that's what we ought to do the first thing every day, seek Him. And then you, there's a whole list of things you'll look back earlier in this chapter that He talked about that people have need of. Talked about how He took care of the lilies of the field and different things such as that. And, and goes on down through and talks about how that the, these lilies can't take care of themselves, how that He takes care of them, but how much more better are we than them? He says these clothing, food, raiment, and all these things will be added to us, drink, the things that we need, the basics, necessities of life. If we'll just seek Him out first, all these things will be added to us. And you get to look at it in our life. If we'll slow down and just be real serious about it and look at our own lives, how, how much seeking are we really doing? You talk about seeking, that's looking for something. That's going after something every day first in your life. I mean, I've mentioned some serious things here tonight real quick that he said to put first. And these things are things we ought to just make a list and keep right in front of our Bible and look at them every day. Are we doing this? Keeping them first. You know, I have to stop every day and look at myself. If I ain't real careful, man, I'll get messed up in a hurry. If I, ain't. I mean, that's just the way I am. I'll be off somewhere else in a different direction in a hurry if I ain't real careful. We ought to ask yourself tonight, are we really putting these things first in our life? Been good to be in his house, Bill. We've been a little bit of help to you this morning and tonight. Hope everybody has a good week. See what God's been good to us. He'll give us a good week if we'll just ask him and help us. Been good to see everybody. Hey, invite somebody to come to church with you next Sunday. They might show up, might surprise you. Just invite somebody to think about it sometime this week. Say hey, this tell them where the church is at. They might show up. You can never tell. They might get saved. Might show up and sit there and stay. You know, God can do them things. It's been good to be here.